All righty, everybody. I just got the okay to start the show. So once we find out this answer to the last uh, space question, hey, there it is. It was answer C. We'll begin our show. So now we're going to be transferring, uh, transitioning into the unknown. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, once again, welcome everybody to the Morrison Planetarium. I want to introduce myself real quick. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter for this afternoon. Uh, just a heads up, I'm not a floating voice. I'm actually a person, and I'm standing right behind you at the pilot's booth. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. Everything that you see in purple is going to be one enormous screen. Thanks to help us six different projectors hiding throughout this planetarium dome. That's going to give us a very immersive experience. So everything that you're going to see on the screen is backed by scientific data, evidence, peer review, critique. We also like to mix in science visualization to give you that very immersive experience that you're all about to experience in just a few moments. And just to let you know, folks, the show that we're doing here today, right now, is different from all the other shows that we've done today. Uh, this one's called Tour of the Universe. And essentially what that means is that we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth, and we're going to zoom all the way out to the very edge of the known universe. But this show in particular, we're also going to be focusing more on the moon. Uh, we want to dive in a little bit more about certain objects out here in the universe. And one thing that we kind of tend to overlook a lot is the moon. So we'll be going in a little bit more in depth about the moon. And then we'll continue our journey to the very edge of the known universe. So just to give you a heads up. And uh, also, I don't know if I just mentioned that, but uh, I'll be talking for the next 30 minutes. So this is going to take us to the closing of the museum. And before we get started, I got to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We're going to have a great experience inside the planetarium. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside because we want to keep this theater nice and clean. So thank you for not snacking during the show. We also want to make sure you... Uh, that there's no feetsies on the seatsies, because again, we want to make sure these seats are nice and clean for everybody coming in the future. So thank you for keeping your feet on the seats, or not on the seats, on the floor. <laughs> Excuse me. Also, folks, please, please, please wear your mask while you're inside the Morrison Planetarium. It looks like we have about 110, 15 people in here. We're going to be here for 30 minutes in this enclosed space. So again, please wear your mask over your nose. I can't stress that enough. Thank you so much, y'all. And also, folks, if you happen to have any cell phones, uh, smartwatches, tablets, Anything that produces is bright white light, now is the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, put them away for the next 30 minutes because these, devi these devices produce really bright white light that can be distracting for the folks sitting behind you. And also, folks, you're more than welcome to exit at any moment during the show. Uh, if you do need to leave, please make your way up the stairs. That's where the exits are going to be before, during, and after the show. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs, not down them. And lastly, folks, this show can be quite immersive. We have this enormous 75-foot dome above us. Uh, if at any moment the show becomes too overwhelming, you become motion sensitive, there's a really quick and easy solution for you. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths. Your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling through space, at least not more than the usual. Hee hee hee. But with that, everybody, it looks like we're ready to go. So let's get started. All righty, everybody. So we, again, are starting off pretty close to home. We're starting here at the International Space Station, or what we like to call the ISS. And if you can't tell, uh, just below us is planet Earth. We can see the city lights, because uh, right now we're on the nighttime side. So we can see all the city lights pop up down below. But again, I want to focus on the International Space Station, because this thing is incredible. Essentially, the International Space Station is a research facility that's orbiting around planet Earth, and they conduct all sorts of ex uh, science experiments up here. For example, how does water, fire, how do plants uh, pretty much behave in a low gravitational environment? So they conduct all sorts of science experiments up here, and this is a collaboration between many nations across planet Earth to pretty much figure out what happens to things in space. But not only that, the International Space Station uh, is going incredibly fast. It's going a whopping 17,000 miles per hour, and it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Ooh, how romantic. <laughs> and folks, uh, from right here, it looks like the International Space Station is uh, pretty far away from Earth. It's not too far. It's only about 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. 250 miles, that's like a nice uh, road trip with the family from San Francisco to Santa Barbara. A nice road trip to get away with the family for the weekend. 
And also, the International Space Station looks incredibly large here on our dome, but it's only about the size of a football field, and new compartments keep getting added to it every year, so it gets slightly bigger as uh, time progresses. And the International Space Station can fit anywhere from six to eight astronauts at a given time, comfortably, in these modules here. But for now, we're going to slowly leave the International Space Station behind, because again, this is tour of the universe, and today we're going to be focusing more on the moon. So we're going to be leave, leaving the International Space Station. As we slowly see it disappear compared to our Earth, we're going to notice a nice little orange line that's going to represent the path of the International Space Station. So we can still keep track of it as we zoom away from our planet. Ah, now we are looking down at planet Earth, but let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. Now, folks, we humans have been to the moon before. Uh, this was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions. That brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon. And just to let you know, this is the only brief presence of humans on another body in the solar system. But we also have to give a very special thank you to a, an amazing person by the name of Margaret Hamilton, who was the lead software engineer who programmed the Apollo guidance software and anticipated potential scenarios that might have led uh, to a landing abort, which one of these scenarios actually did happen on the Apollo 11 uh, uh, space mission. Her team recognized it and was able to instruct the astronauts to continue with the landing. So without her, we might have never have landed on the moon. So again, uh, we got to just give a special thank you to Margaret Hamilton. But again, uh, we sent humans to the moon over 50 years ago, about 300,000 kilometers away from Earth in a linear can to land on the moon and safely return to the Earth using a guidance computer with only 72 kilobytes of working memory. That's less memory information than an average song occupies on your cell phone or less memory than a digital watch that you're probably wearing on your wrist right now, which is pretty much, which pretty much shows that with uh, with perseverance and ingenuity, humans can pretty much do anything that they set their minds to. So again, a very special thanks to Margaret Hamilton. And we humans are planning to send humans to the moon again, thanks to NASA's new space mission called Artemis. Now, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo in Greek mythology, which works pretty well, because again, Apollo space missions, and now Artemis. And Artemis is going to be sending the very first woman to the moon, which, and also not only that, it's going to be making steps to setting up a lunar base here as well. The mission should be launching in the next year or two, as long as everything goes accordingly. So cross my fingers. Look out for any news about Artemis in the coming years. But also one of my favorite things about the moon is that we only ever get to see one side of it from here on Earth. But why is that? Turns out the moon is tidally locked with the Earth, which pretty much means that the moon takes just as long to rotate on its own axis as it does to revolve around the Earth. So we only ever get to see uh, this side. We call it the near side. And the side we don't see, well, we call that the far side. And I know some people like to still call it the dark side of the moon because of a famous 1970s rock album. But the dark side still gets illuminated by the sun as it orbits around the sun. So it's not necessarily dark. Um, it still gets illuminated by the sun. But also one of the coolest things about the moon is that it's one of the very few experiences that is shared throughout humankind. Now, for the most part, every human has seen or experienced the moon in their lifetime, which is pretty wild to say because we don't have that much common with a person 60 years ago, let alone 600 years ago, or even 6,000 years ago. But the moon ties us all together. It inspired so much of human history, like legends, mythology, romance, movies, and even cartoons. But let's take a look at some of the features that we have here on the moon. So let me just orient myself really quickly, figure out where I am on the moon. Ah, there we go. So we're going to be making our way over to the, one of the most recognizable craters here on the moon, which is called Copernicus Crater, which is this large crater right over here. It can be easily seen here from Earth. Um, this crater is so big, it you can fit the entire Bay Area inside this crater. So this is a very large crater, one of the biggest on the moon. 
But if we go a little bit to the side over here, we can also see a nice mountain range on the top right corner. We can see a nice ridge of mountains. Now, these are some giant mountains. Uh, one of them is called Huygens, and another in this uh, mountain range is called Hadley. And these things are taller than the Sierra Nevada mountains here on Earth. Now, we humans have known since the 70s and 60s that mountains on Earth are made within the crust of our planet with tectonic plates that slowly push together upwards. And when they crumple against each other, uh, that's where mountains are formed over millions of years. But what's really amazing is that the Sierra Nevadas grow over a millimeter per year, whereas mountains on the moon, well, those were formed in moments due to large impactors from space, which is why we, so, we see so many craters littered all over the moon. But also, I want everyone to notice these dark gray areas. You probably see these here from Earth. But we don't really have any of these things, these dark gray areas here on Earth. Long ago, the astronomer Galileo and his peers thought that maybe these were oceans on the moon, or at least they kind of look like oceans from here on Earth. So they named all this dark gray stuff the Maria, which in Latin translates to the seas, and it's stuck. Uh, there's quite a few here that are uh, called even bays and even oceans. And just to name some of the different ones that they have here, for example, the first Apollo lunar mission, they landed in the Sea of Tranquility. There's also the Sea of Serenity, the Lake of Dreams, the Bay of Rainbows. And then it gets a turn for a worse. It gets a little bit scary. You got the Sea of Crisis and the Sea of Serpents. So uh, lots of different types of names for these dark gray areas. We now know that these dark gray areas are the results of those giant impactors when something big enough from space would punch so hard into the surface that they would form large cracks where lava would flow out, filling in the lowland areas. The reason why it's dark gray is because that lava that flew out, uh, flowed out was rich in iron deposits that gives us that dark gray colorization that we see. And the Earth and Moon are relatively next to each other, and there's essentially the same age, so why don't we have craters all over the place like Moon does? Well, the answer is because Earth is pretty weird. Our surface is constantly changing. Almost every crater on Earth is gone due to erosion, but the moon isn't like that. The moon doesn't have oceans or active volcanoes or weather or even life to change and cover up those impact sites. But I also want to show you, everybody, uh, the far side of the moon. So I'm going to turn off the nighttime of the moon so we can get a better look on the far side. And as we start to transverse over to the far side of the moon, you're going to notice that all that dark gray stuff, the Maria, it doesn't really exist on this side. You don't really see the dark gray stuff anywhere. Now, just to let everyone know, scientists aren't exactly sure why there's not much Maria on this side of the moon. In fact, this is one of the reasons why China has sent the Chang'e 4 lander and U-2 rover uh, mission to the far side of the moon. And this is the very first time anyone has ever sent a rover to the far side. And essentially, what it'll be doing is looking deep into the crust of the moon so we can get learn more about it. Uh, we should be getting updates relatively soon. But I also want to show you where the landing site for the Chang'e 4 uh, lander mission is, which is going to be located right over here. Uh, I like to find it because it, these two craters kind of make a shape of a peanut, if you can see a large peanut. And then inside the peanut, you can find a nice little splash that kind of looks like a dolphin. So this is one way to identify it. Very easy for me. But essentially, uh, this area is called the Van Carmen Crater. And this crater is pretty easy to find because, again, the dolphin inside the large peanut. But why did scientists choose this crater of all the other craters on the far side of the moon? Well, it's because it's part of a much larger crater called the South Pole Aiken Basin. Now, this crater is so much bigger, it's roughly 1,600 miles across. That's about 2,575 kilometers. And it takes up all of the South Pole region of the moon. And it's as big as the vertical height of the United States. Now, the South Pole Aiken Basin is the largest confirmed impact site on the solar system. And it's the deepest excavation site, so if scientists wanted to find older material for the lunar mantle, well, this would be a great place to look because they already have so much uncovered from that big impactor, and they don't have to do so much digging. Now, it's kind of hard to see here, but you can kind of see a nice little dark region. This is the South Pole Aiken Basin, so this is the largest confirmed impact site in our solar system. So right in the middle, in that peanut and then dolphin, uh, that is where the Chang'e 4 uh, lunar mission is at. So great place to look to find that lunar mantle uh, material. 
But before we leave the moon, I also want to show you uh, one of my personal favorite things. Uh, I want to show you one anomaly that scientists are interested in researching. So we got to go back to the near side of the moon. And let me just orient myself real quick. And I believe that is it right there. So what we're heading towards right now, folks, is what we call Rainier Gamma. So as we start to zoom on in, whoops, that does not look like Rainier Gamma. That is the other feature. Ah, there we go. There's Rainier Gamma. So I want to put Rainier Gamma right in the middle. We're going to start to zoom on in. It's this object right over here. So this is one thing uh, researchers still want to uh, learn more about. But essentially, this is one of the several features uh, called the lunar swirls. Kind of sounds like ice cream. Uh, but so everything that we've seen so far has dealt with shadows that comes from height. But what we're seeing right here is totally cosmetic, which means uh, what we're seeing is something completely fat, uh, flat that has no height or depth to it. So this feature that we're uh, seeing appears to be bleached onto the surface in a sense. Our best guess is that the moon's magnetic field froze into the pocket of the lunar surface, which would magnetize the soil on the surface, forming the feature that we see here. Now, we don't have anything like this on Earth to compare it to, but NASA has been studying it for five decades. And we still don't know exactly what it is. So this is something scientists still want to learn more about once we make our way back to the moon. But folks, from here on Earth, it kind of looks like the moon is really far away. It almost feels like here on Earth, you can kind of reach out your arms and touch it, especially when it's close to the horizon. But the moon's really far away from us. It's about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Whew, that's the furthest edge of the human scale. Now, some of you folks may own a car with that many miles on it. If you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop, although I cannot recommend it. The roads are poorly maintained. He he he. And uh, from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick since at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement of light speed. And light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But for now, folks, we're going to be leaving the moon behind because, again, this is still toward the universe. we got a long ways to go to take us to the very edge. But now we're going to start to slowly pull away from the moon. And now we're going to start to see all the orbits or the trails of the planets in our solar system. And folks, on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to the help of computer models like Open Space, this program that we're using right now, to show us the most accurate images and information available to us. Now the nearest star to us comes into view, and the sun's about 93 million miles away from the Earth. 93 million miles away, well, in terms of light speed, that's about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light. So again, it takes that long from light to emit from the sun and travel that distance to reach us here on Earth. But before we leave our solar system, I do want to name uh, the planets in our system so we can still be uh, familiar with them. So right in the middle, we have our sun, Sol. And then uh, the closest planet to the sun, we've got Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth, and then Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places we can actually land a spacecraft on, although some of them you wouldn't want to because of the extreme temperatures there. But then beyond Mars, we also have something called the main asteroid belt. And this is what the asteroid belt would look like for to highlight all the asteroids in our uh, main belt. There they are. And then beyond the asteroid belt, we have the really big planets. We have the gas giants, the Jovians. We've got Jupiter, Saturn, and then we also have the icy giants, Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. And then, of course, I can also add Pluto's trail, although Pluto is no longer considered a planet, but now considered a dwarf planet. But Pluto's not the only dwarf planet out here. We've got quite a few, like Make Make and Haumea. And then also in the main belt over there, we also have Ceres, uh, the large, uh, another dwarf planet closer to us here on Earth. 
And but before we leave our solar system, I also want to show you the spacecraft that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system so we learn a little bit more about them. We have uh, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and the latest of them, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby uh, with the orbit of Pluto right over here in 2015. But we're going to leave our solar system, folks, because now we're going to be heading in interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha, Cent Alpha Centauri system. But we also want to stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now we are stepping inside the radio sphere. So, folks, this is the radio sphere. This represents uh, the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting from the Earth. Now, this began in the 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, and radar signals, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. All these things are emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. Since all these signals are electromagnetic, they travel at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is expanding at the rate of one light year per year, so is anybody out there listening? And really quickly, folks, I want to show you, um, I want to bring up all these markers. These markers represent some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has one or more planet orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets. And we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far today, we found more than 4,000 exoplanets in our nearby vicinity out here in space. But that number is going to be constantly growing because we have new space-based telescopes that are constantly scanning the night sky looking for as many exoplanets as possible. So that 4,000 is going to be increasing in, as the years come. But to figure out if any of them are Earth-like, well, our technology is not yet able to answer that question, but new generations of astronomical instruments are devoted for that search. But the important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody out there that's able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. And of course, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere more than 90 light years away have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. But folks, I want to put away the exoplanet markers, and I want to leave our radio sphere there, because that makes a great reference point, as huge as humanity's influence is on the nearby uh, universe to us, nearby galaxy, interstellar space, it is nothing compared to the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. Can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> Just kidding. But folks, uh, our Milky Way is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross from one side to the other, it's going to take you 130,000 years traveling at the speed of light to cross uh, from one side to the other of the Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in this galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave, I do want to stress the shape of our Milky Way galaxy. We live in a nice flat spiral disk. So when we look at it from a sideways perspective, it kind of looks like a big uh, flat pancake. But this is great because when astronomers want to learn about the universe, it's so much easier for them to look, point their telescopes and equipment galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, which has stars, planets, gas, uh, that obscures our view of the universe. So just keep that in mind. We live in a nice flat spiral disk. But the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many, many galaxies out here that comprise the known universe, folks. And as we continue out, every single point of light that we're now seeing no longer represents a star, but now represents the location of an individual galaxy. Each galaxy containing uh, billions, perhaps trillions of stars. And as we continue zooming out, folks, you're going to start to notice that these galaxies start to form a shape. They start to form clusters of galaxies and also great regions or voids that have very few galaxies. 
And we also got to give a special thank you to an amazing uh, astronomer who created this amazing galactic map that we're able to fly through. Uh, his name is Dr. Brent Tully, who worked at the University of Hawaii, who compiled this with the work of other astronomers over decades of time to give us this, again, amazing map that we can fly through. But now we have automated systems that are mapping the most distant galaxies, folks. So now we're going to be looking at the large scale structure of the universe. And remember, every single point of light we're seeing is an individual galaxy, not a star. Woo. And just a heads up, folks, uh, the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. Remember when I just said we live in a nice flat spiral disk of our Milky Way? Well, if we're to line up just like this right in the middle, that's where our galaxy would line up. So again, we look galactically north and south to find and discover galaxies way out here. But folks, our technology will eventually uh, fill in those dark gaps. It's only a matter of time. As our technology progresses, um, it'll get better, and we'll be able to map all those galaxies in those dark regions that we're unable to find right now. But we're going to continue pressing on, folks. And now we're going to be heading so far back, we're going to be heading to an earlier time of our universe because now we're going to be looking at the quasars, which are these orange dots that we're seeing on the outskirts of the large-scale structure of the universe. Now, the quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources, and these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're, view we're sort of viewing an awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So now we're going to be looking even much further back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we are about to reach the very edge of the known universe. This is what we call the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. Now, all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And this is a picture of a very baby universe only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And what we're looking at is not a typical photo, but a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded, with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions, and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, they gave rise to the large-scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how this happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us, so we only have one direction left to go, back home. Now, before we make our return trip back home, I've got to ask y'all to prepare yourself, because this could possibly be the worst free-falling dream ever. He he he. But let's find a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies as we make our way back to planet Earth. There we go. All righty, folks, let's return. So, folks, we're crossing an expanse of 13 billion light years, and we present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy. New generations of telescopes and spacecrafts are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I'll remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to take a look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But for now, folks, it looks like we're making our way into our Milky Way galaxy. We're heading straight to that radio sphere. And of course, we're making our way downtown, walking fast faces past where we're homebound. <laughs> And now we're approaching our star system, our planetary system. Passing the spacecrafts that we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system, passing the orbit of Pluto, 
and making our way to the third rock from the sun, our home world, planet Earth, the only place humans have ever inhabited out here in space. And as we make our final approach to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching it with me today. I hope you did enjoy it. And as we make our final approach, uh, that's going to be all I have for you today. And once again, we made it back home safe and sound. Ta-da! Thank you, everybody. All righty, everybody.